Yo, what's going on? So today I'm going to be talking about the concept of a fragrance pyramid and also about the concepts of top, mid and base notes. These are things, these are terms which come up very frequently in perfumery and what these things effectively are are kind of simplified models of looking at your perfume, looking at your raw materials and I'm going to kind of talk about these concepts in this video. Firstly, I'm going to quickly explain what they are if you haven't already heard of them but then I'm going to go into them and look at what are the kind of positives and the advantages of using these kind of simplified representations, but also what are the drawbacks and in which cases do we kind of need to move beyond them and realize that everything isn't that simple. Okay then, so what is this fragrance pyramid thing all about? Well, a fragrance pyramid is quite simply when you draw a pyramid and you classify raw materials as top, middle or base notes. This you may do from the kind of point of view of a raw material itself, as in, hey, I've got a raw material and I'm going to classify it as a top, middle or base note. Or you may do it from the point of view of a whole perfume where you draw a whole pyramid and then you populate that pyramid with your raw material. So you say, I've got this and this in the top notes, this and this in the middle notes and this and this in the base notes. All right then, so what are these top, middle and base notes? Well. Let's start with the top notes. So the top notes are the materials in the perfume which last the least amount of time. These are things which are very volatile, so they evaporate very quickly, which means they only stick around in your perfume for a short amount of time. I would say, for me, probably about 15 minutes on the skin or maybe about an hour or so on a scent strip. The one thing you've got to bear in mind with these top, middle and base note classifications is they're quite fuzzy. Um, the exact numbers, everyone's kind of got their own idea of exactly how long something should last to be a top note, a mid note, or a base note. But for me, the top notes last, I would say, 15 minutes on the skin, roughly, or an hour on some fabric or the scent strips. So, for example, top notes might be things like citruses, like lemon or orange oil, which evaporate very quickly. There are a lot of green notes, so things like grassy notes, like cis hexanol, or more leafy notes, a bit like triplal. These, again, are top notes. These are things that often they're quite strong straight away, but then they evaporate quite quickly, which means these are the things that are never going to be long lasting in your perfume. Next then for the mid notes. So like the name suggests, these things last a fair amount of time, but not forever. These are things I would say last about an hour or so on the skin, but about maybe three hours to a day on the scent strip. These are things like your florals, so things like rose, jasmine, nerily, and some woods, for example. So you've got stuff like cedarwood and oakwood, I would classify as middle notes. And obviously that's just a tip of the iceberg. There's gonna be loads and loads more in each of these categories, but those are just a few good examples. And then finally, we've got the base notes. So the base notes are the notes which last the longest amount of time. So these can last for a day or so on your skin or on the scent strip or on some fabric. So say you spray the perfume on some clothes, these can last around like a week or a month or even longer than that. So the base notes, for example, are things like musk, so muscanone, ambretolide, exaltolide, that kind of thing. And then you've also got your woods and some ambers, so things like ambroxan, and you've got other things like animalic things as well, like civets, for example. Now, before we move on, I really wanna hammer home that these boundaries are fuzzy. This is kind of because for any given raw material, whether it's a natural or an aroma chemical, it could really have any amount of time that it lasts on the scent strip. There's not kind of some magic number that we can pick to kind of distinguish between what's a top note and what's a mid note, because what if it was like one second apart, but because it was over the boundary, we classed one as a top note and one as a mid note. So for this reason, we can use these terms in a kind of fuzzy way as well. For example, we could call something a top mid note. So it's kind of somewhere between a top and a mid note. Again, that same thing, we could also say in some situations that it's a top note, but in other situations that it's a base note. And this kind of depends on the context in which we're talking about it. So for example, say there was something which in general, I would class as kind of like a top mid note because it's somewhere between a top and a mid note. Well, if I was making a cologne kind of fragrance, which is full of citrus and lots of really top notes kind of things, in that context, it might actually be better to class this kind of top mid note as just a mid note because it really kind of helps us see the difference between this, which is actually lasting a bit longer than everything else. So again here, these terms are really something that we use to help communicate and help with a quick understanding, but they're not things that are necessarily set in stone all the time. Right then, so the first place that this fragrance pyramid 
actually pops up is often as a marketing tool. If you've bought perfume in the past, you may be familiar with it in this context. What happens is a few key notes or some key themes are picked out and these are just listed as marketing things for the consumer to kind of see and make associations about the perfume with. Now this is actually something that's quite important because most consumers don't have any kind of knowledge really of perfumery. They don't understand all the aroma chemicals or all the naturals or raw materials that have gone into the perfume. So it really helps them kind of focus on the key ideas inside of the perfume, even if they're not particularly familiar with the smells that have gone inside it. Now there is a little bit of a debate around fragrance pyramids, especially along the lines of how accurate should they be? Now I think both sides of the argument are kind of interesting on this. One side is kind of like, well, fragrance pyramids should always be as accurate as possible. This is a bit like if you're buying a car, you might wanna know how much horsepower it has, how much torque it has, and the size of the wheel rims, exactly that kind of thing. Now, I think this is a valid argument, but one thing that I would say about it is if you bring it to its kind of logical endpoints, it does imply that the preferable thing would be to have a listing of exactly all of the different raw materials, aroma chemicals, everything that's in the perfume. And obviously this is gonna be something that no consumer would really want. Unless, of course, you're another perfumer trying to steal the formula. However, I think there is something to be said about the truth of what's in a perfume, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Now, in my personal opinion, I do think it's okay to be fairly liberal with the descriptors you're using in a perfume pyramid if you're using it for marketing. The reason I think this is because when you're buying a perfume, what you're buying is a fantasy. You're buying this kind of piece of art. You're not buying the sum of the raw materials exactly that's inside it. And in this kind of vein, the marketing around the perfume is actually part of that fantasy. It's part of that piece of art itself. The way I look at it is a bit like a painting in a picture frame. Yes, you might say the piece of art is pretty much the painting inside the frame and the frame could be anything, but the whole piece, the actual whole piece of artwork as a whole is the painting and the frame that it's in because you see them together. And even though the frame is kind of on the sidelines, and in perfumery, this would be things like your packaging, your bottle, your marketing, it still contributes to your overall kind of experience of the piece of art. And going back to the car example, this is a bit like, say I'm selling a blue car. I could say, hey, I've got a car in cosmic blue or I've got a car in tropical blue. I think it's perfectly valid for me as the kind of car manufacturer to be able to name my paints in these colors because again, it creates a certain kind of extra layer to the product itself. That said, however, I still think it's important to be truthful. For example, if you made a nice synthetic oud accord, I think it's fair enough to say there's notes of oud in the fragrance, but I think it's very important to make the distinction that there's not actual oud in the fragrance, because if you say there's actual oud in the fragrance, that's lying because there's not oud in the fragrance and that's misleading. So I think as someone, if you're going to start selling your fragrances, there's kind of this very fine line here and you wanna be quite careful exactly which side of it you walk on. And while we're still on this topic of fragrance pyramids in marketing for perfumes, another question is, is it even appropriate to have a fragrance pyramid? Now, the reason that this really kind of took off and started was back in kind of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, there was a very famous perfumer called Jean Cars. And this guy had his way of working and his studies, which often centered around treating base, middle and top notes separately. And in his actual style of making perfumes, often his perfumes had quite a distinct top note opening, quite a distinct middle note, and quite a distinct base note. So for those kind of styles of perfumes, having a fragrance pyramid in your marketing is really quite appropriate. That said, both before and after Jean Carles, there are lots of different perfumes which are not kind of split clearly into these three distinctive sections. There are lots of perfumes, for example, which are fairly linear with time and don't really change much over time. In these examples, you might not want to use kind of a pyramid for your marketing. You might just want to say it smells of this and leave it at that. That's perfectly fine too. But again, it's something to realize in terms of marketing, the pyramid sometimes is useful and sometimes it's not. So it's something that you kind of, I think you should just use your own judgment on and think about in each case is it nice to have a pyramid? Do I think it, it's worth having a pyramid or do I not wanna have a pyramid this time? Again, it really depends how you feel about how your perfume performs and acts over time. 
Okay, so now we finished talking about the fragrance pyramid in terms of a marketing context, what it looks like to a consumer with a finished perfume. Now we're going to talk about it as a perfumer yourself, and when you're looking at your own raw materials, your own ingredients, how you can kind of apply this concept of a fragrance pyramid to help you think about the actual notes in your perfume while you're constructing it. Now, going back to basics for a second, what I was saying before was, the fragrance pyramid is all about how long notes last. So if you think about it, every kind of aroma chemical or every part of your formula, there is a certain amount in it at the start and over time, some of it evaporates off and what makes the different notes last longer or less is that some notes evaporate quicker than others. So after a certain amount of time, there's gonna be a lot left of the things which didn't evaporate so much, but the things which evaporate quickly are mostly gonna be gone. So what I've done is I've made a nice little visualization, which you can see on the screen, which is kind of a time dependent version of the composition of your perfume. And we're gonna use this to go and kind of answer some common questions about base notes and top notes, this kind of thing and the implications for you as a perfumer and how this can kind of help you think about your perfume. So then, at the start we have a perfume, a hypothetical perfume which I've made, and I've split it up completely evenly, so one third each of top, middle and base notes. Now this is kind of based on an exponential decay model, which I think shouldn't be too far off what happens in reality. What you can see is at the very beginning, there is this even distribution of top, mid, and base notes. But one thing that's quite interesting to notice is often top notes, not always, but often top notes can be perceived very strongly. So sometimes our brains actually perceive certain top notes more strongly than base notes. So this means even though the concentrations of the raw materials at the beginning are the same, the top notes might actually dominate the perfume, and this is just because of the way we perceive things. Now, that said, this is not always the case. Some base notes, yes, are very subtle and transparent, like a lot of musks, and this is kind of why we dose them so highly, because even though that we've dosed them highly, it's not really getting in the way, for example, of the other notes. If anything, it's just helping make sure that we can smell them by the time it's only them that's left. On the other hand, if we have very strong base notes like Sibet and Indol, these things are gonna be really strong in your perfume. So if you dose them highly, even though they're base notes, it doesn't mean you're not gonna smell them. It just means your perfume's gonna smell really strongly of these things the whole way through. So that, for example, is why when we're using these really strong things like Indol or Sivet, we would always wanna keep them dosed very lowly to make sure that they're never in a position where they can dominate the perfume. So then, as we move through time, we can firstly see that the top notes are lost quite quickly, and then the mid notes are kind of lost after that. When we get to the point of around four hours, so I've kind of estimated this based on skin, so obviously on scent strips or cloves, it's gonna last longer, but after about four hours on the skin, you've only really got base notes left and a little kind of tiny hint of the mid notes, which is still around. It's really at this point when, if you look at the perfume formula as a whole, what's left of it, now about 80% of the base notes, and there's kind of something like 15%, maybe 20%, 10% left of the mid notes. And the base notes are only getting more and more of the total formula now over time. This is when the musks really start to come through because even if they're quite soft and subtle, when there's nothing else to kind of shout louder over the top, now all that's left is these kind of silky musky smells, if musks of course is what you're using as your base note. That's not to say that you will never smell musks at the start. Of course, you can smell musks at the start, but especially if you're not so used to smelling things like musks, they might go unnoticed by you in favor of the really more shouty, loud top notes. Now, this of course brings us to one of the most common questions that I'll get about perfumery, which is how can I make my top notes last longer? Well, looking at this graph, we can see the top notes don't last long by definition. There is no way that we can make the top notes last longer, realistically. Yes, there are things like fixatives, but they aren't really gonna have a massive effect. They might help it last something like 20% longer, a little bit longer, but they're not gonna make it last as long as a base note because those molecules, they're still gonna evaporate off. There's, you know, you can't really trap them without making them trapped to the point where you're not gonna be able to smell them, realistically. There is no magic trick of how to make top notes last longer. 
That is the eternal problem of perfumery. That's kind of the art of it itself. It's not how can we make this certain smell last long. It's how can we work with the palette of materials we have, some which last for a short amount of time, some which last for a long amount of time. This is how we have to think as perfumers. How can we create this kind of fantasy, this journey, this whole experience, which smells good at the start, good in the middle, good in the end. How can we bring together some materials which maybe smell great, but they don't last a long time, together with other materials that last a lot longer, and how can we create a balance and kind of perfume overall? Think about it as, say you really like some top notes. Well, think about those as this kind of gem that's about to slip away into the ether. So at the beginning of the perfume, we wanna nest that gem in some nice supporting mid and bass notes, and then we want to have it so once that that gem itself has gone away, maybe the mid and bass notes are still reminiscent of the same theme, so that the whole story of the perfume as a whole comes together into one thing that makes sense. That means we're not going to get banana that's sticking around for like 8 hours, 10 hours, but we can maybe have a bed of musks that really juxtapositions, for example, well with what a perfume that started off as smelling like bananas, for example, because banana is a top note. Finally then, that brings us to the question, how accurate are these descriptors, top, middle, and base notes, and should we use them, should we not use them? Well, it depends. At the end of the day, these things are really quick to say, top note, this is a middle note, this is a base note. That is really quick to communicate. If someone asks you a question about a perfume, kind of aroma chemical, you can quickly tell them, oh no, this is a top note, this is a base note. That is really helpful in terms of quick communication or even just as ways to kind of denote things for yourself. If you want to organize your ingredients, it really helps to split things into maybe three categories, top, middle, and base notes. That kind of thing can be helpful. But then we've got to remember at the end of the day, this isn't the fully accurate picture. So firstly, everything lasts a different amount of time on the scent strip. Everything is going to drop off at a different period. So everything is really somewhere in between. We've then also got the fact that some materials are both top notes and base notes at the same time. You especially find this with things like naturals or pre-made accords, really things that are mixtures. They may have some parts which act like a top note, but then later on there's more of a base note effect. One example I'll give of this is frankincense. So frankincense at the start smells very lemony and sharp, so it acts as a top note but it's also got these balsamic resinous notes in as well, and these kind of act more as fixatives and last a long time. So if you smell frankincense on its own, at the start it smells completely different than it does after, say, a day of leaving it on the scent strip. But this also carries over into the perfume, so it's really impacting both the top note region of your perfume and the base note region of your perfume in different ways. And then finally, of course, I've got all of these evaporation curves that I've shown you, but the reality is they're never going to be perfectly smooth curves and there's going to be so many different curves and each one represents a different molecule. Each of these molecules are interacting in different ways, they've got different chemistry behind them. This means some things might fixate other things in your perfume and some things might even react with things in your perfume. So the shapes of these curves over time are really kind of going to be distorted and warped and changed by the specifics of the thousands of interactions that are happening in the perfume. So because that's something that's so complicated and we're never really going to be able to get a grip on, the easiest thing to do is just don't worry about it. Just think about it in simple terms when it's useful and apart from that just start making your trial blends, just get creating and learn from experience what works and what doesn't and that way you're really going to I think learn the most in terms of practical knowledge and that's going to be able to help you make actual perfumes. So yeah, that's pretty much what I got to say on the subject. Uh, and that's pretty much it from me. So yeah, thanks once again guys for watching. Um, I really hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you thought of it. Let me know your opinions down in the comments. And yeah, I really hope you learned something. So thanks once again. Have a great week and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.